This podcast was created during the 2023 WGA and SAG after strikes. We understand that without the creative influences of these unions, we wouldn't have a show to talk about. So we encourage you to continue to contribute to the Entertainment Community Fund. You'll find the link in the show notes and continue to support it even after the strike is over. Thank you. High Queen Morgays of Andor has issued the following proclamation. The following discussion will include spoilers from the Wheel of Time books by Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson. We ask that you read those books so that our discussion does not spoil you. You have been warned, so it is written, so shall it be done. Welcome back to another edition of Book Reader Edition of Bustin' Blockbusters regarding the Wheel of Time. Matt here with you. Remember, the social is at Bust Blockbuster. You can send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com. That's M-A-T-T-S, audioblog at gmail.com. You can always leave comments on our videos at Double P Media's YouTube channel. Search for youtube.com slash at the word double, the letter P, the word media. I would prefer if you did not contact Double P Media with tweets regarding book stuff because Bubba is not a book reader. You can also find Priscilla, who we will have on a later section of this podcast by commenting on her videos on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Priscilla TV one. And Priscilla has only read through book three, I believe. So try not to spoil her past that. Although I do it on a regular basis because I just can't keep my mouth shut. So I guess what I'm asking for is for you to have more restraint than I do. But we're going to once again divide this podcast up into two sections. The talk with Priscilla will come after this first section, which will include information from all of the books. And then the conversation with Priscilla will be restricted to basically book three, as long as I can keep my mouth shut. I apologize for not getting the episodes three and four out in terms of book talk until now. I had a serious problem with my computer. So we're going to combine three, four, and five here. I also have a serious problem with the fact that none of you have guessed which TV franchises are in the background of our video of Book Readers Go to Hell. Now, I wasn't actually making fun of us book readers. I'm a book reader myself. I just got a little tickled by the whole bit with everybody getting upset about Uno. And yes, I know you probably love Uno too. And feel free to leave hateful comments to me in this video for saying that I don't really think that Uno matters that much. But I'll get more into that in my full book spoilers talk. But none of you have entered this contest. I can't even buy your participation with a $100 Amazon gift certificate prize. Just go to my X account, my Twitter account, at Bust Blockbuster. The video is pinned to the top. Watch that video. There are five covers, two covers of the same book are in there. But each of those books have either been part of a series that's been translated into a television series or are a separate part of a book series that has been translated into a television series. I need the names of four TV franchises that are based on those book covers. The book cover name will not necessarily be the name of the television series. And that's the only hint I'll give you, but isn't it worth a chance at a $100 Amazon gift card? Come on. You can send your guesses to the same contact information that I gave you earlier. Let's get into book talk. Once again, I want to point out full book spoilers, all the books for this section, which means that if you haven't read all the books and you don't want to be spoiled, I don't know why you're here. Go away. Well, don't go away if you want to be spoiled. I mean, that's your choice. So the first thing that I'd like to do is go through a little bit of feedback that we got from our first book reader podcast, and it's feedback regarding my all books section. 
So I want to place this feedback here because I don't really want to spoil Priscilla on this. But a wonderful post from Ailthas, A-I-L-T-H-A-S on YouTube, giving me a little bit of a correction and clarification regarding Varen and Tomas. Because I think I might have stretched things just a little bit in regards to Varen. Ailthas said, Tomas was a dark friend and actually wanted out. Varen mistakenly gets involved and rolls with the opportunity to study them. So thank you very much for clearing up my memory on that. Let's give ourselves a start in about talking about these episodes by just some of the key differences in episode three from the books and why I think that they really actually enhanced the storytelling rather than detracted from it. And of course, I'm primarily talking about the arches. Now, the arches, as we went through the ceremony, so to speak, of course, there's fewer people, fewer sisters around, and that's fine with me. Different sisters around, that's fine with me. All of these actresses are great, and so I loved seeing them. And once again, hats off to Zoe Robbins for just killing these scenes. They were amazing. But the arches tend to represent a past, a present, and a future. Your past fears, your f present fears, your future fears. And the books take a different course because the books actually in the first one, the past, goes directly into the whole spinning of the wheel and the fact that souls return to the wheel and then are spun out again in new bodies generations later. Now, we've seen that evidenced with Rand, of course, as far back as season one, when he was remembering Luz Theron's stuff while he was at the Eye of the World. But the interesting thing is, is that with the Forsaken, it seems like, as of episode four, that for those particular beings, it's not so much a returning of the souls being spun out again by the wheel. That is the case in the books, but it doesn't appear to be here. Instead, they've given these Forsaken some kind of immortality. Maybe they'll explain it by the fact that they were trapped in these seals, and during that time, somehow they became immortal. Maybe they'll explain it that through their powerful magic, they became immortal. After all, we have seen examples already of the idea from the books that the Aes Sedai live much longer. But either way, there's no explanation yet as to why these beings are immortal. And we may not get it, or we may. Either way, I'm okay with it, because I want Natasha O'Keefe to come back as Lanfear every time. It will take some of the surprise element out of it for me, but I'm still looking forward to any time that Lanfear comes on screen and Natasha O'Keefe is playing her. But I went down that somewhat of a rabbit hole just to explain that because Nynaeve's arch, her past in the books, she battles a Forsaken that we're never going to see in the show. That one being Agonar, the one who created the Shadow Spawn and all those kinds of creatures. But Nynaeve wouldn't even know who Agonar is in the television show, correct? So just like they're restricting this version of Nynaeve, whoever she's reincarnated from, they're restricting her experiences to Nynaeve's own life. Whereas the way I interpreted it from The Great Hunt, the first test of Nynaeve's was actually from a past life where she faced Agonar. Now, it could simply be a fear of the Forsaken. I suppose in the books you could have naive understanding who Agonar was in the first book. But it makes much more sense to me to interpret it as one of Nynaeve's past lives facing Agonar. Maybe I'm way off on that. Let me know in the comments. Or you can contact me on the socials at busbockbuster, or you can send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com. But because we don't have Agonar in the show, we had to come up with this in naive experiences, and I love the fact that they brought up the experience of her losing her parents. That, to me, invests us much more in naive's life, because even though that's been somewhat mentioned before, somewhat alluded to in the first season, not necessarily that her parents were killed, but that she had been adopted, this way we have something to glam onto and care about naive. 
as opposed to just a display of the one power. The second arch is probably most like the book second arch of any of the three arches where Nynaeve does return to Emmonsfield and sees herself as being supplanted. Although it's not Matt Cawthon's mother, it's another woman, I believe, who's acting as Emmonsfield's new wisdom. And the circumstances are slightly different, but that one is probably the most relatable directly to the book of the three of them. In the third one, Nynaeve does build a life for herself with Lan. She actually goes away from the arch, or let the arch go in a way, and builds a life with Lan. But what I really loved about this version was the way that the arch came back. There are lots of fake-out deaths in this show, and there are lots of arch fake-out deaths now, because you don't really know which arch is real until you get to the end. But I love the fact that because using the one power is something that's not supposed to happen in the arches, even in the books, that that would have enough power to reopen the arch for Nynaeve to come through. And all of those things, to me, made the whole accepted test much better. At least as it relates to our television story, there were no disappointments for me at all. And as I said in the TV Friendly podcast, when Nynaeve came out of that last arch and there was blood on her shift, I started bawling. It was just so awful, so powerful. I felt so terrible for her, and thus, I really think they handled this part really well. Let's talk about another difference that I found to be better, actually. Min is one of my favorite characters in the books. I mean, just like all of these characters, they drive you crazy at some points. But you also just love them. And I seem to recall a reference here or there in the books of men just wishing that these visions, she didn't have them, right? So I love that as the motivation for her to get this ball rolling with Matt. But this is all a lot different. Of course, Matt does spend time in the tower in book three, but he's there for completely different reasons in the television show. And I loved how they weaved all of this into a storyline that can finally get Matt and Min headed towards Falma in the same way that everybody else is, because that's where this season is obviously going to come to a head. As you know, we've introduced some key Aiel personnel in episode five, and that doesn't happen until book three. And right now, I am wondering, because we've seen stills that have been credited for episode eight, the, fi the finale of this season, and they appear to be in Falma. I'm beginning to wonder if they're going to just drop most of the tier storyline completely, unless they combine it with some of the Emmons Field stuff for season three and some of the book four stuff. I would be okay with all of that, simply for the fact that I understand from a television standpoint, it's going to be darn hard to have a sword like Kalandor without it giving some kind of impression of being a cheap imitation of a lightsaber or a weird imitation of a lightsaber. And reminder that this is a sword which ran basically, at least in this early section of the books, he gets it, he uses it once or maybe twice, and then he puts it back and leaves it behind. So they could easily drop that part. And if they need Kalandor later, they can introduce it at that time. And yes, another rabbit hole there, but just to get back to Matt and Min and headed towards Falma, where they both end up at, of course, at the end of book two with Rand and all of the rest of the gang. Them getting to Falma via a different method, especially when you consider episode four, that Min has now found out that she's been working with Leandrin, who's promised to end her visions. And it turns out that it's actually Ishmael who is making that promise. The actual way that Min and Matt get to Falma can only enhance the story for the television audience and enhance Min's character, at least to me. Because otherwise, you've just got a girl who is there, doesn't really know if she actually wants to be there or not, and just kind of tags along and ends up in a mess with the other girls. And I can't remember if I mentioned this in the episodes one and two book podcast or not so forgive me if i'm repeating myself 
But the whole situation with men challenging Matt to go through that doorway feels like a foreshadowing or at least a metaphor for what Matt goes through in books four and five, where he goes through two separate doors. I think it's books four and five. I know that the door where he gets the spear is at Roydian, and I think that's book five. Speaking of that spear, and I know I keep going off on tangents here, but speaking of that spear, is the spear that we've seen promotional stills of Matt holding seemingly in Fama, is it that spear that he got by going through the door in Roydian? It would be weird to bring that f this much forward, so it could just be just a staff. But I think some people did look at those screenshots, and you could kind of see a raven on the wood, which would make it seem very much like what Matt basically died to get in Roydian. Maybe they'll bring forth the heroes and one of them will award him the staff and we might skip past the doors throughout the series completely. I hope not. I want to see all those beings on the other side of the doors. Foxes and snakes, right? I really want to see that. And I've gotten myself down another tangent that has nothing to do with any of these ep three episodes, three, four, or five. But one last thought on that is I'm wondering if perhaps Min does turn Matt over to Ishmael and we get Ishmael forcing Matt through a door that might get him the spear. Okay, okay, I promise I'll, I'll stop talking about that. But the other big change from the Matt and Min stuff is that vision that Min has. And I don't have any idea what to make of that other than what I said in my TV only friendly podcast and that is that it may be just symbolism that if Matt does reacquaint himself with that dagger that it could be the end for Rand. I also did like Bubba and Priscilla's possible explanations of the fact that you know they did make a promise to kill each other if either of them started to go mad from the one power. Either way, all of this is a little different, and I am perfectly cool with it. I think that it makes these stories more interesting, and it's a good way to try and give book readers something to have fun with as well as we try to get these characters back to the places that they were in the books when so many changes had to be made at the end of season one. I also mentioned this in the TV Only Friendly podcast, but I did love at least the little inclusion of Rand burning the invitation and it being pointed out that he's playing the game of house as well. I do wish that they had Tom this season simply for the fact, and I think I mentioned this in the TV friendly podcast too, but if not simply for the fact that to television viewers, Tom Marilyn is just a guy who Rand and Matt just kind of stumbled upon on their way to Tarvalon and he helped them out of one bad situation and they think he's probably dead. And at the point that we leave Tom in White Bridge, I thought he was probably dead too. So it was a great relief to me to read in book two that Tom was in fact in Carrion and that Tom was very good at playing the game of houses. And there's so much about Tom and his history with Elaine and Queen Morgays. And maybe the actor just wasn't available for filming. Or maybe, you know, some of the stuff with Tom and Rand in the foregate is a little cumbersome for a television story when you can sum up the game of houses in just a couple of scenes and also combine that with Rand being with Celine slash Lanfear. And one of the things that Rafe said about episode four was he wanted the audience to really be invested in Celine and Rand as a couple when the shoe drops and you find out that Celine is in fact Lanfear. I don't know how much of a surprise that actually turned out to be. Our non-book reading podcaster Bubba had already figured out that she was at least a dark friend. And by opening the fourth episode with that whole forsaken Lanfear prophecy slash poem, I think everybody had put it together well before the reveal. The real surprise was the sword going through her chest and her living. As I mentioned before, this is a big change for the Forsaken. Somehow they are immortal. Will they explain that in the show or will they leave that a mystery? I'm not certain. 
nor do I think it really matters that much, but you can guarantee that people who didn't like not getting answers from Lost rather than just being invested in the characters will be complaining about this if they don't give some kind of explanation about that. That won't be one of my complaints, naturally. I was one of those people of Lost who said it's about the journey, not the destination. I get a lot of slack for that. Nonetheless, you do have a whole lot of this show trying to invest you in things that turn out to be red herrings, a lot of fake deaths, and sometimes my complaint might be that they're trying just a little bit too hard to make things interesting for the book readers, and instead, because they go so far the other way, it just seems silly. And I don't want to really put Leandrin in that category. However, given that I know Leandrin's allegiances, while I really appreciate Kate Fleetwood's performance of Leandrin, and I really like the extra details that they've put in in order to make things more gray, to make Leandrin have a personality. It just goes so far sometimes to an extreme that the only investment that I have in it is seeing how non-book readers react. And I'm not the kind of person who likes to watch watchers. I like to get my entertainment from the entertainment itself. I don't watch reaction videos. And if you watch reaction videos, I have no problem with you either. If that's the way you get entertained, you know, there are people who like drama. At the same time, there are people who like reality television. They are different tastes, but no one is better than another. But once again, it just seems to me sometimes that the showrunners are trying a little bit too hard to make us book readers almost lean into, whoa, what are they going to change here? But the truth of the matter is, is that there haven't been too many butterfly effects. Leandrin still did what she did. We just care about her a little bit differently in the television show than we do in the books. On the other hand, with Uno, we barely got to know him in the television. So his death was, of course, monumental and, of course, surprising for book readers. But one of the reasons I did that whole book readers go to hell thing video, well, one was for the contest, but the other one was for the fact that I was making fun of people who were getting so upset about this. A television audience isn't nearly as invested in it as we are, and all it does to me is it signals the fact that if Uno isn't that important to these storylines, how many of these storylines that he's on is all that important? Are we going to go on a whole season of adventures with Nynaeve and Elaine? And yes, I will miss Uno, but I can't hold a television audience responsible for investing in a character that they never really got to know. And I can't complain about a show that realizes that and has already probably worked out the butterfly effect of that. And I understand this is a book reader podcast and I am supposed to be talking about book and show differences. But the more I look at this and I'm not trying to just be a rah, rah, rafe kind of guy, but I think that some of the changes that you saw in season one were related to the pandemic, especially at the end of season one. And I think what I'm seeing is a television show actually working its way back towards the books rather than drifting further away. And I'm really, really good with that. And I do have faith that we are just getting maybe a slightly different turning of the wheel. There are book reader fans of A Song of Ice and Fire who absolutely destroyed Dave and Dan well before season eight for changes that they made. As fans, we can be guardians of the books and we can, of course, express ourselves. But Harriet didn't give us the rights to write the television story. Harriet gave that to Amazon, who trusted Rafe. And I am good with almost all of it. As I said, there are some things that are just kind of annoying because I feel like sometimes Rafe tries a little bit too hard to fool the audience. And sometimes I think he gets confused himself as to whether he thinks he's trying to confuse the television audience or he's trying to confuse the book readers or at least keep them invested. And that's something that Rafe will improve over time. He's already vastly improved it since last season. Wow, I've spent a half hour on episode three. This might be a long podcast, folks. Although I don't really have that much to say about episode four. 
because we've kind of already discussed some of it. Men meeting with Ishmael. Somehow they have to get Matt and Rand back together again. And they have to get everybody back together again in Falma. And I think you see more of that happening in episode five as well. But I want to point out that really what's happening with Moraine and Rand in episode four has essentially nothing to do with what happens in the books. But I think it can be kind of representative. In fact, all of Moraine's storyline outside of, you know, being shielded or cut off from the one power is essentially her chasing Rand down the same way that she kind of did in book three when he was on his way to Tyr. Obviously, there are some big differences. They've moved Loghain, which we've talked about before, to Carrion. And the only thing that concerns me about that is Loghain, of course, is in the tower when Swan and Leanne are deposed. But I do love how in episode four, Leandrin actually hinted at that when she was talking to Leanne in regards to news about the Shan Shan or what was happening in the West. So at least, even if they are going to drop Loghain's involvement in that entire storyline, and maybe they will, maybe they won't, time will tell, but regardless of that, Dave acknowledged or foreshadowed it in the television series. But as far as Moraine and Loghain are concerned, of course, that doesn't happen. I have liked the involvement of Rand with Loghain early on, even though that also doesn't happen in the books. It does carry a few shades of some things from later books. But all of this Sherlock Sedai, all of this Moraine stuff, before she tracks Rand down, is just essentially her chasing him to tear, just in a different place. So it's a nice way that you can say, uh, we're throwing book three stuff in here. And I find it kind of fun. I've already talked a lot about the Forsaken being immortal, but one thing that I did love at the end of episode four was you could see a little bit of the fleck in Lanfear's eyes before she blinked. And then, of course, in episode five, you see it a lot more. So book readers were already going crazy about that in episode four and then probably to see it even more in episode five made everybody excited for the true power being revealed. The revelation about the true power doesn't really happen till the book that I'm in right now, Crown of Swords, in my reread. So by employing this story in this way, at least Rafe is acknowledging some things from later books that we can glam onto. And I know that was a very short stint into book four, but I do want to move on to book five so that we can get to our conversation with Priscilla. I loved the scene between Leandrin and Lady Sarath. A lot of that was that contention and talk about the master was very relatable to the passage in The Great Hunt. The fact that Nynaeve and Elaine got away, where Egwene did not, also the same. Of course, the difference is, is that the girls went willingly with Leandrin in the books. Here they were taken by force. And of course, Min is not with them. But as we've seen, they've already given Min a storyline that I actually think is more interesting. A nice look into Teleron Riyadh, I guess is how you say that. I don't remember how it was pronounced in the audio versions of the book, but I love the dream world, both when Lanfear and Ishmael meet up, as well as at the end of the episode when Moraine encourages Rand to go to sleep. And oh my, do I love the look of Lanfear in that last shot. That was wonderful. I honestly thought when we saw that in trailers that that was High Lady Sarath, but it wouldn't have made any sense for him to be on a wheel like that all by itself without her being surrounded by guards or up on a big throne after we've seen this. So I do love it. I also like that they've taken the mask off of Lady Sarath. Love the introduction of Tuvok. Still don't get if we've actually seen the Horn of Valir yet. Just the box, right? Unlocking, it wasn't really revealed, or I couldn't see it in any shot. W w wait a minute, did I just say Tuvok? I'm sorry, Turok. Can you tell I'm a Star Trek fan? Anyway, sorry about that. The other thing 
that's really cool is seeing Rima, who in the books has already been broken by the Shan Shan, I believe. She's one of the imprisoned with Egwene, but I don't want to talk too much about that. Here she's in her full yellow Aja state. We'll talk about that with Priscilla, because she has, of course, read that part. And of course, we get Avienda. Yay! Avienda is my absolute favorite Aiel. Although Gaul is pretty fun. And they really kind of just employed her into Gaul's storyline from book three. I do love that she mentioned to Perrin about the Karakhan, that Giato was mentioned. Now we know that Bane and Chiad have also been cast, but I don't know. I think there was some behind the scenes promotional footage for season two of them standing with Avienda. So Avienda may not be alone. But she certainly seems to be right here. So you would think that they're going to have to meet up with them on the way to Falma. But Aeola Smart is absolutely killing it as Avienda. There's definitely some behind the scenes footage already of Aeola really making an effort to do most of the stunts herself. So that fighting sequence was fantastic. I have no disappointments about that. Our TV Avienda is ever bit as badass as our book Avienda. Perrin and Elias have parted ways, which is no problem for me, since Perrin's really on a mission now to just save his friends. We don't need any more sniffers looking for Pat and Fane. Everybody knows where he is, probably. And Perrin got the basic download on what being a wolf brother is from Elias, so the rest of his journey is his. There are a couple of occasions in the books where Perrin encounters other wolf brothers who have, uh, shall we say, evolved a little further. And I think one of them is in book three. Maybe that's book four or book five. I can't remember now. My mind is all blurring together, but it's not a very pleasant thing. Yet Elias still seems to be halfway here so maybe the show's not going to go down that route although Elias is quite a bit stronger given that he was a, actually a warder before this happened in the books I don't think that was mentioned in the earlier episode we of course have seen a still of Perrin and Nasima and Avienda all standing together that is tagged with episode 8 so Looks like Avienda and Perrin are going to be together for the rest of the season. Totally good with that. Love that they've established that Giotto is not sexual. <laughs> there were some funny moments with Avienda. Like I said, I love Iola Smart. And I think her and Marcus really had a good episode. As far as Rand and Moraine running from Lanfear, the power that Lanfear has exploding people's heads, making mouths grow shut, all the terrible things. I did like how they kind of had Celine be just a little bit unhinged from time to time regarding Rand, especially in that dream. Again, probably tell Rand Riyadh. I'm going to have trouble with that word. I'm probably just going to say tell Al Riyadh because that's what tries to come out of my mouth every time I say it. So forgive me for that. But at the end of, what was that, episode three? Yeah. That's the land fear that you see throughout the books, which that unhinged ex-girlfriend kind of thing. And they gave a little bit of backstory on that, which I'm totally cool with. More importantly, during the land fear and Ishmael meeting in Tel Riyadh, in the dream world, that's what I'm going to say. In the dream world. I loved the subtle reminder that the time period that the Forsaken are from, Ishmael, Lanfear, and the name drops, which I'll get to here in a second, is from a time that is not unlike our own future here on this planet. Slightly in the future, which coincides along with Robert's books a great deal. The fact that people are still riding around on horses. And even Lanfear makes a joke about how horses are so slow. 
near the beginning of the episode when she starts to chase Rand. Mogadine and Grendel. Love those name drops. And then she just refers to Samuel and Ravine as the boys. So that's six of the Forsaken. We suspect that there's only going to be eight used in the television show. You had this eight statues from season one. You have the eight triangular sections of the seals, especially when that one was broken, when Lanfear was freed. Tells me that there's only going to be eight Forsaken throughout the show. So who are the other two that will appear? Because I'm assuming the boys, she's actually referring to all four, maybe? And I can say probably Ravine and probably Samuel. But who do you think the other two Forsaken may be? If there are only eight, who are we eliminating? I mean, obviously... Agonar is not going to be in it. So eight out of the 12. I had thought that they're going to combine Loghain with Asmodian in terms of telling Rand things about the one power and different kinds of weaves and all that stuff. So I kind of eliminated him. So that's 11. So which three will get eliminated? If you're a book reader and you think you know, please let me know. Leave comments in the YouTube below or you can contact me on social media at Bust Blockbuster or you can send emails to mattsaudioblog at gmail.com M-A-T-T-S audioblog at gmail.com The other thing that I really loved about this scene with Ishmael and Lanfear is the distrust that all of the Forsaken have for each other. How they're all trying to get to, you know, the number one dark one spot, which according to this, Ishmael seems to have right now. Although we all know that Ishmael is a little bit delusional himself and very vain, but aren't they all? Because they all think that they should be the one sitting at the dark one's side. And how, at least here with Ishmael and Lanfear, they openly admit that they have no real love for their fellow chosen ones. It's all a beautiful demonstration of what the relationship between each of the Forsaken are in the books. And I think that that's all I'm going to talk about here. So let's get to our conversation with Priscilla regarding, if not all three of these episodes, at least this latest episode, episode five. Dedicated to Robert Jordan's Wheel of Time book series. You also mentioned, Bubba, that all of these different Ajahs, these different types of Aes Sedai, have different colors that they wear and everything. And what is white but the absence of color? And the Wheel of Time television series on Amazon Prime. But white is the combination of all colors, Matt. It's the black <laughs> that is the absence of color. I, thought, I uh, think you, you missed that lesson. You missed that lesson. Oh. You're listening to Bustin' Blockbuster's Wheel of Time podcast. Look, I didn't choose this path for myself any more than you did, but I will follow it because I must, 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 must. Well, must, we're must, back must, with Priscilla, and we promised you this podcast last week. We didn't get it to you. Sorry about that. I'm Matt. Don't forget, at Double P H Q on the socials. Although, you know about this stuff, don't spoil Bubba. Priscilla tried really hard yesterday to spoil Bubba, and it didn't no, work didn't. out. So why don't we talk about this episode and the prior episodes as well that we didn't cover delete, last week? Delete all that. No. Okay. I will delete it. I promise. Let's talk about these episodes, three, four, and five. Priscilla, first of all, let's just talk about episodes three and four, if you have anything that hasn't already been stated in other podcasts that you feel is important for our listeners to know. I think it's important to know about the relationships between uh, that have I said I aging slowly and uh, their families and how they most of them are encouraged, I would say, like to just stay put in the White Tower or like to not get too involved, too attached. Because that has been taking place, this conversation since uh, the second episode. So we had like second episode with Leandring and going forward, uh, the third episode, 
uh, and then there was more rain, fourth episode, fifth episode now, and uh, also the fourth episode that we saw Alana with her family. So just to make sure that people understand like the impact, how the slow aging process has, that not everybody is like Moraine, who just uh, chose not to do family stuff. She doesn't spend time with her family. She doesn't engage with them. Uh, or Leandri, who actually is keeping her family a secret. There are some others, as we saw with Alana, like she's visiting there with her family. She has a good relationship with her family. And what is also implied is like there are differences, cultural differences among the Aes Sedai. Um, like Alana comes from one place, Moraine comes from another place and another class, social class. Uh, Leandre is also not explicitly told but uh, she also comes from like another background that is not Moraine uh, we saw in the first season how pissed she was at Moraine just for Moraine existing so uh, we should not just uh, discard that, uh, that there are other differences among the others uh, the I said I that it's not like they behave all the same there are other things. So Moraine is a member of royalty, so that also factors in, in the way she behaves. So the Aes Sedai are naturally arrogant because they have this power and this power over matter. In the case of Moraine, she is also royalty and she also comes from a country that is known for political intrigue. Because they have the game of houses, which precedes uh, the game of thrones. So it's not something, it's an idea that it was there. Uh, it's something that also Rafe says. And that's where I really noticed that he understands the material. He said that the Wheel of Time is something between Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones in terms of uh, content. I completely agree. I'm just on the first book, but I, I, I get it. I get it what he's trying to say. Right. In you terms brought up of a couple scope, of things that like, I'd like to talk yeah. about, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things you brought up, Moraine, and uh, as book readers, we know, I don't know how much you know of her backstory, but you do know, like, Barthanas mm -hmm. in this episode uh, is a significant name. Yes, in, in, in the, the, the great, great hunt, hunt, right? Yeah. yeah. So let me let me ask you this because this is for people once again who know the books. Are we have mild spoilers here up to book three, I guess, and and I guess Priscilla, you've probably been spoiled on other things that go beyond that, if not by me, then by yeah. other people. So because mm -hmm. uh, I try real hard to spoil you just like you try to spoil Bubba. But one of the things that uh, that came to mind is that whole history of her family, how her king actually, or, or her, I guess it, in the books, it was her uncle that became king, right? Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that's really interesting to me in all of these shots within that Damadred house is on the door, like on the door, there is the tree of life etched on the on the front of the door where her and Rand went into and that's part of the thing that mm -hmm. disgraced the, the family yeah. mm -hmm. because he cut down I guess they gave the Aiel gave them a a cutling of the tree of life and then he chopped it down to make his throne is the way the history goes in the books and I'm not sure if you were aware of that or not but that's the extent of that history and so the Aiel have a very much a dislike for all of Carrion and because of what they did to the Tree of Life, that's why that Aiel Carrion and War happened, more or less. And the, uh, you know, we saw Errol in the very first episode. Uh, he's a veteran of that war. That's why he mm -hmm. gets so freaked out when he sees Rand and realizes he's an Aiel. So 
that was all interesting to me. The other aspect of it that you brought up was Alana's situation. And with Alana, we have a situation where uh, in the books, it's actually, I think it's even in The Great Hunt where Moraine alludes to the fact that she's already kind of made plans to pass Land's bond onto her, except it's if she dies. And that is to an Aes Sedai by the name of Morel. But it appears mm -hmm. that Alana is kind of taking what would be mm -hmm. Morel's place in mm -hmm. the story uh, for now. So I like that. The other thing uh, that I really no, like was... I, I have to stop you that because I, I had the impression exactly that Alana was going to fill in and that uh, Len was going to be bound to, uh, to her whether he liked it or not. Right. But she gave him this idea of actually waiting for Naimi. So she he's not bound to her. She didn't do anything. No, no, yet. the bond hasn't so, happened. But I'm not exactly. saying that it happens so, with Morel either. All I'm saying is Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I I'm I'm not sure if it will happen and if right. Alana is but, going to Yeah. Right. All I'm saying is that Morel is kind of the stand-in, or uh, Alana is kind of the stand-in for Morel's mm -hmm. position. Yeah, is all I'm mm -hmm. saying there. But the other thing about Morel or uh, Alana, pardon me, listeners. And the other thing about Alana is that book readers who have read well beyond book three know mm -hmm. that I know what that is. whole yeah. force the bond on mm -hmm. somebody is a big yeah. deal because she did yes. um, do that to Rand. So that's exactly why I, I was surprised. I know about the spoilers for the most of the books. Um because I like oh. going to forums, I like I I like I like I like spoilers. I like going to forums, I like to see discussions. Uh I don't care about spoilers. I'm not like Okay. We're moving uh, the meter up to heavy spoilers then. We'll just include Yeah, yeah. Uh whatever. So though. I was surprised that she had the sensibility of going to land. And talking to Len about these things because uh, I expected her just to okay, I got a new order, ha ha ha. I'm here. Moreni gave me another one, ha ha ha. I'm going whether you want it or not. I'm going, but she didn't. So I, it's one of those things that leave you to wonder, like if it's going to be a change from the books. It's not going to be a change from the books. It will be another situation. There will be some other like ways how to achieve the same storytelling, you know, with, through other uh, possibilities. Yeah, I don't know. I, Elana, I'm a, I'm a bit on the fence so far. Okay. Uh, let me ask you. I, I know I'm just briefly mentioned Orthanus, but are we going to see him cut up in pieces? I think you were like joking about that, but I think they are setting up possibly Moraine's sister to be a dark friend. Moraine's sister to be a bark dark friend, not Berthanas. I, I can no, I can tell you why. Moraine's sister, she is very adamant about the downfall of the family, how it affected her personally, and how Moraine was oh. expected to after completing her training as an Aes Sedai to return to Kyrene and, like, get things on the way for the Damadras, Damadras to return and then go whatever she does. Because once you are an Aes Sedai, you can leave and go from the tower, you know? Right. And she never did because of Rand and the Dragon Reborn that became uh, Moraine's life. So everything paled in comparison. So that sister of her was alone, being spit on her face, so that sister had the, you know, she had the yeah. motive. Exactly. She had a very hard motivation. Okay, I'm here by myself. My father cannot be trusted. Moraine is not back. I have to make do of this. How do I make do? And she keeps saying, don't spoil things for me. My 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 son is going to marry the, the queen. So it's pretty much established that the son does what the mother say right so is the son it is, the son is a younger now no because batan is in the book he was older too so 
I would say if somebody is a dark friend, uh, everything indicates that it's, uh, it's a more sister, actually. There's also the possibility yeah. that uh, Barthanus, despite what his mother is doing, has made a deal to me uh, to, in order to, yeah. to get the position mm -hmm. of power. Uh, so yeah, to yes. me, either you... or both could be dark. Friends. Either or, yeah. The reason why I keep suspecting Barthanus is because his sudden fascination with Rand, the way he really paid attention to him when he first met. That's him. true. Um, That's true. But. Yeah. But, it, but I, I agree with you. It's it could be gay. either or both. It could be <laughs> either or both. Both. Uh, we at least we have a motivation from her, and we have, uh, I guess, a uh, a way that Barthanus is looking at Rand from him. So look, it, look, it, it can be both. Uh, the first, uh, the first scene of the first episode already established that like there, there are families being dark friended. You now there was like this small girl. Uh, supposedly it was her mother's house. I don't know. And uh, Ishamaya was there and turned the the girl to the to the shadow. So maybe that's also what happened there. Maybe they are both completely opposite Moraine. And you even see, like when Moraine was talking to the sister, the sister makes don't tell me. She says, "Don't tell me whatever you're doing. Don't tell me. I don't want to know." It's a yeah. no, so and it, it's exactly and, and it's the Bartonis who asks Moraine to stay for his wedding. Yeah. So we know that Ishamael is sending Matt there, and we know that Ishamael, the last location that Ishamael knew where Brand was, it was in Tarim. So maybe Ishamael is going to this wedding. Oh, that would be interesting. That would be very interesting. Yeah. So uh, they are converging a lot of characters in uh, Falma and Kyrene. So I would think like uh, the penultimate, uh, the, uh, the seventh episode might be in Kyrene and then the final in Falma. Wow. That long, huh? That's my money there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about Falma for a second. Uh, we briefly in the non-book reader podcast said there's Rima, the yellow Aja who's in there, and that's important. Now, she is the one, I believe, in the books or in The Great Hunt who has already been captured and is the one who mm -hmm. talks to Egwene a lot um, or begs her to remember her name because they she's getting basically broken by the Shan Shan. So are we going to see Rima be captured and converted? I hope will she not. be with Egwene or will they just do uh, something separate? Because if they do something separate, then they're creating yet another butterfly effect, which I'm cool with. Look, I'm, I'm actually, I would be glad if they didn't. I don't want a wheel of time to be going into torture porn, Game of Thrones mm. stuff. I was very vocal about being very impressed by their first season uh, since we saw um, Child Valda with Egwene and Perry. Yeah. How they dealt with Egwene's torture. It was all about her reactions to what was happening to her, and it was not sexual in any way. They were like undressing her. But very methodically, and uh, they were not leering at her, and uh, like like she was trash basically. And I was very impressed that they went to this route. And with Perry, it was a little bit more explicit, but it was they made sure to to show his eyes more or less, yeah. obviously because of the wolf thing. Uh, and they would cut to Egwene's reaction and uh, with Valda's voice and stuff. So they were. They took pains not to show. Well, and they even the have this and season, and stuff. Priscilla. They even have this yeah. season. Think about Nynaeve's test, because those are taken naked in the books. Um, yeah. They at least let her keep a shift on in the television yes. series. So they're still making an effort to uh, make yes. this a little bit more age friendly. Although I, you know, some of the themes and everything, I'm not sure that I would let anybody younger than 14, if I had a child, watch this. 
Um, no, no. Let's be honest, Matt. If it was uh, uh, like Game of Thrones or or the other like series that came, the scene between Lanfear and Rand, Lanfear would be like they would put her cheats out. Let's be very clear. If it was yeah. like D and D, they would That's have true. put like Lanfear on the top of La of Rand there with without at, at least yeah. a shirt. Right. So they didn't do that. So I'm I'm okay with that. What I'm trying to say is that um I don't want them to use I mean because it's horrific what the Shen the Shen Chen do anyway. And we are, and they already showing us exactly who these people are. So they don't yeah. need to be very explicit anymore. And they already have Egwene. So it would be redundant um, to put another one there. Okay. Uh, but let's talk about some of the, the heinousness of, of what the Sean Shan are doing, because a lot of people at first at the, at the end of last season and at the beginning of this season were saying, well, there's no leashes. Where are the leashes? Which is a weird thing to ask for or to nitpick about, but that's what some people were saying just because I guess they needed some reason to hate the television show. And, uh, Actually, I think it was pointed out on one of the social medias, and I'm sorry, I can't credit who it was. I know that uh, WOT series on X recently reposted it, but they showed something from episode two where Perrin and them were being captured, where you could see the one power flowing into which, from what looked like a string. And we actually did mm -hmm. get a physical leash on Egwene here, but I don't... And I'm going to spoil something in further books. Uh, there is a point where some similar kinds of devices are discovered or created that do not require a metal leash. They only require the piece that the, the holder is holding and the piece that the, the slave is wearing in order to keep them, uh, you know, under the control. And just like you uh -huh. said, you said, you know, you can hook. Uh, you could hook the wrist piece onto a peg and that's the furthest that the person can go. The same, the same way works for even these ones that don't have a leash or a, a distance can be determined. Uh, and there's somebody that we know that actually ends up devising that. So I won't say anything more until you get there, but it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. My thing, my whole thing, the only thing that I wanted to say, and then I'll let you comment afterwards is do we need it? Uh, it is very visceral, uh, and we've seen it once. Uh, we probably will see it again with Egwene once or twice, unfortunately. Um, but to be tied up like a dog, to invoke these images of slavery that uh, our own, my own country uh, has a terrible issue with even acknowledging sometimes, uh, it's... it's disgusting visually uh, but it's gonna make you feel a lot of horror for Egwene and is it needed do you think it's needed I mean if they as I said if they are going to use Egwene and only Egwene to show it and not overdo it right I would trust them uh, because past behavior is a good indication indicator of like future behavior and they already impressed me in the first season so i if they chose to go this route to show which i think they will actually because it's Egwene and Egwene had been kind of uh supporting the naive uh naive character act so far so she needs something not in terms of an actress, but like for the the whole the character needs like a moment for you to see how strong she can be and how her personality can how how she can raise to occasion because that's going to be one of the defining char characteristics of Egwene. She will raise to the occasion how courageous she can be, and if they do that, uh, if they choose to do that, I would trust them to do it well. And not overdo it. What I'm, I'm kind of like scared is because um, 
like the Shenzhen Kane and they are not going anywhere apparently for like some time now. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the plans of the adaptation will be. But I don't want them to keep like showing over and over and over again mm-hmm. how terrible they are. They already like they already established and they 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 doing a great job establishing. But I don't want them to fall for the torture of porn. Right. I don't know if there's anything else to say about that. I agree with you. I I agree that once we establish what this culture is, and we do have to go to some lengthy extent in these, at least probably in this next episode, in order to really make things seem weird. Because I I thought it was odd that Turok threw in that, that mission statement at the beginning, saying, you know, to unite the people in to fight the shadow you've got ishmael right there so he obviously knows doesn't know and has already figured out a way to contend with that um Mm -hmm. but nonetheless i just was wondering if that would make people not uh, once we see what happens to Egwene, they Mm -hmm. maybe they'll completely forget it but i thought it was interesting that rafe brought that in because that is something that uh Mm -hmm. lingers throughout the books the shan shan don't go away and they keep coming back, not in full force or whatever, but you keep running into them and they do play a big role in the later part of the books. So I hope that we do get the brutality out of the way. Something else that I keep thinking about as far as we're talking about Falma is how everybody's going to get there. And there's some some little traveling things, especially in episode five, that I thought were pretty interesting. One, Lanfear saying, you know, a horse, what a slow way to go, basically. Right. And I that's a reminder for everybody to go back and look at the end of uh, the cold opening of season one finale and remind you that Lanfear, Ishmael, they all come from a time mm-hmm. that is basically our world just a little bit in the future. Uh, and so uh, then the world broke and everything started again. And even Ishmael and Lanfear talk about how they, how little they've progressed uh, over the thousand or what is it, three thousand years or whatever since the last time that everything happened, that the world broke. So I love that. The other thing that I want to talk about, and then I'll turn it over to you, is there was this stone that you could see with old tongue mm-hmm. all over it, uh, kind of on the left of the screen as Lanfear was whipping her lightning whip to get her horse to go and riding by. And uh, some people are asking if that could be one of the portal stones. I don't think it is. I don't think they're going to do portal stones. I don't think we're going to get flicker flicker. Uh, But if it was a nod to the portal stones, uh, I would be accepting of that. I mean, if it's supposed to be a portal stone, but they don't use it, that's fine by me. They showed one of those in season one, two. One of those. When Matt and um, and Rand were arriving at Tarvalon, we saw them passing one. Okay. Remember that. I... So I'm not sure if they're going to keep showing one thing like for two seasons now without making use of it. You understand? Yeah. Right. Uh, so this I'm not sure. Um, and I was thinking I like also in season one we saw some like like skyscrapers. I think our world, what well, it's the first age, right? And then Louis Terring world would be the second age. And then this is the third age that they are now. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, so. because because there was like uh that's what I when I was getting to the books and deciding if I was reading it, I wanted to know more about the the world. Okay. And they would like the concept of the history being cyclical so uh and there's seven ages on the wheel and then it and all there's seven ages again. exactly yeah. exactly and so basically our world without magic would be the first age like the first stage of it and there there is still they can still see like our arch- archaeologists still found things about our world in the second age and the third age so then, then you have the second age, which is the high, the the like the high point. And then we saw, as you mentioned, like the 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 ships and like the flying cars and everything. It was pretty futuristic. 
and then there is this the breaking of the world and then we have uh, Rand's world which is not a medieval thing but it's kind of like 1800s but they still have like they have a lot of magic still but not and they uh, can expect some things to return from the second age so this I would also expect that they would make use of the stones at some point because one um they're telling a story about a coming war, war, but also like um, people they are very inventive in a way, right? And they make use of what there is, and they are trying to figure out ways to like to fight these people. They're actually better than them in this skill, which is the the channeling. There's another thing that um, actually comes up in books beyond where you are and that is another method of traveling and i was wondering why lanfear was complaining about horses being so slow when i would think that she would have access to that kind of traveling um obviously she's a master of telam riyadh teleron riyadh but also uh all of the forsaken and Rand eventually learns something called traveling, where you essentially cut a hole in the world. And there's one of two ways to travel through mm -hmm. that hole. Either you're cutting a hole directly to another place and you can just walk through, or you cut your hole into this space that's in between that's not unlike the ways, except you jump onto a rock <laughs> and the rock travels you to the, the place where you need to go to. Mm -hmm. And then you recut open the world or the, the hole is already there. Um, that's a little bit slower, but it's all still much faster than a horse. And I would think mm -hmm. that Lanfear would know how to do that. So I'm not sure why she didn't because, well, yeah, well, I'll just say that we have a character that is female. It's not just like it's a male thing or a female thing because we have a character in later books that actually does create a window like that. Um, and out of fear more than anything else and is able to jump through it. And then uh, one of our characters also has to go follow them because they've gone to a completely different place. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not like only males can do this, even though typically in the books, you only see males do it. We have seen in the books, females do it. And I just figured as powerful as Lanfear is, she would probably be, be able to do that too. Well, I don't know about the series lore, yeah. But she, she. Well, that's what I'm asking. The, maybe, the, maybe they're going to eliminate that possibility altogether. Maybe yeah, portal stones I, is the I fastest way you can go now. Either they are having to choose things that they are going to keep in the story, so that people that didn't read the books, the regular folks like me. Um, because they just read three. Um, because they cannot keep introducing new stuff all the time, right? So maybe they are like That's pacing. the way they do it in the books. Maybe they are trying to pace the like the the ads on, so to speak, so that people don't get overwhelmed, which is the reality of like TV storytelling. Like, you don't you don't keep introducing things like or or, or maybe Lanfear, because she had since uh, recovered, she was not, I don't know, strong enough. I don't know. She had, like, she had just regenerated herself. Maybe she was like, oh, I'm just, I'm just weak for that. Maybe I cannot do that. I don't know. That's the only two reasons that come to mind. It, that works. I, I, and I understand those reasons. I'm just saying that the books, kind of dole, doled them out slowly themselves mm -hmm. because you don't see the traveling okay. until I don't think book four is when you first see the traveling. Um, although you get an indication that one of the Forsaken is using. is traveling. Yeah, okay. is using the traveling, I think. Uh, ah, I, so maybe you'll, you'll answer already. Like they're adapting the first book. They didn't arrive there yet. Right. Okay. Well, uh, we do know, as I mentioned before, that Lanfear is very powerful in Teleron Riyadh, the dream world. Um, and I think that Rand's in trouble 
just a little bit in trouble. <laughs> uh, I think we're going to see the real Lanfear as if we haven't seen her already. We're going to see the real Lanfear come out. But there's a lot of stuff that happened between her and Ishmael in and in that room itself, because I looked at that room and it looked like that there were actually some uh, like seals uh, or they looked like the seals, the portal stones are portal stones. This The seals that we've seen like him break out of Lanfear, just smaller versions of them in the walls. And I was trying to count them to see if we could figure out how many uh, <laughs> Forsaken there might be, but I only saw one or two and we didn't get all of the angles of the room. So I don't know if that's going to help. But Tel Am Riyadh is a place that people can at least communicate over long distances. And that happens a lot in the books. And obviously, Lanfear is not where Ishmael is at the same time. So they met there. Um, I really loved Lanfear kind of giving Ishmael the, the almost like a congratulating a, a pet or something oh you're doing much better with the dreams and everything when he uh he figured out or was uh appearing as rand or she was appearing as rand i guess but at any way uh she is the number one queen of Teleran Teleran riyadh the dream world i'll just say it that way because i keep messing that word up um i, so, can, I don't even try to say Teleran riyadh you did it better than better. I did in one try. Very good for you. Uh, not so good for me. But uh, I I loved all of that. But I also loved, as we mentioned in the TV Friendly podcast, all of the mentions of uh, specific Forsaken. And as I said in the non-book reader podcast, we know we have Ishmael. We know we have Lanfear. We now know that we will likely get Mogadeen and Grendel, and I don't think you've gotten there with them yet. Maybe no. maybe there's an allusion to one of them in book two or book three, but you just don't know who they actually are yet. Uh, so you'll have to read book four to figure that out, I think, at least book four, maybe book five. At any rate, uh, we got their mentions, uh, and those two characters, Mogadine's one of my favorites, actually, of the, of the Forsaken. Glanfear's my absolute favorite, but Mogadine is one of my favorites. And then the boys, I think you have read about. You've read about Ravine, right? In book three? Mm -hmm. Maybe not. Maybe not until book four. No. no um, I, I, read, I read a lot about them, but not in the books directly. Okay. And so then, I get confused. But yeah. Ravine is the one that is a little bit crazy, right? Yeah. Uh, and we haven't there's no indication that he's been freed in the show yet, but he's the one, okay. he's the one that ends up in Camelin, uh, and kind of manipulates ah, with, things. With more her. gaze. Yeah. Yeah. There is one that, so, that is with more gaze and there is one that's, that that's invented, Ravine. there is one that is invented the creatures, right? The Trollocs and stuff. Who was it? Well, the one that created the creatures was Agonar, and I don't think we're going to see him. No. Um, because he was in the first book also, and he was the one that was in uh, Nynaeve's first test. Yeah. So since yeah, we haven't I seen know. him on yeah. either of those, I think they've eliminated Agonar. Uh, Samuel, the Samuel the is the one that is in Ilion, um, and I think that we will see him. So I've got Ravine and Samuel definitely, but if they're only okay. going to do eight, I want to wonder who the other two are, uh, because she basically said the boys. Uh, and it could be any four. Uh, mm -hmm. But I believe that Ravine and, and Samael will make appearances. So now I'm just down to two left if there's only going to be eight instead of the 13. Don't, don't you think they can, like, combine? Like, give Oh, they will. You, yeah, they, they, yeah. they will. But I'm just saying that um, the they, have to, they have to give them one name, right? So which name yeah, will they give Yeah, exactly. Them? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Like Vatanis, what they did with Vatanis. Right. Exactly. They they picked up somebody with the name Damodred and just rearranged the family tree. All right. Something else about Tel Riyadh, and this kind of made me just a little bit angry once I thought about it again. When are we going to stop calling these little battles Tarman Gaiden? 
it, it it's happening almost as much as the naive fake out deaths naive mm-hmm. everybody thought she was dead after emmons field everybody thought she, she was dead here in the arches everybody thought she was dead after the big standoff at faldara um, but she keeps coming back and now ishmael is saying tarman gaiden is upon us and i'm like going let's not use that right now because that's not anywhere close to what tarman gaiden is I, I it does demonstrate ishmael's kind of delusional nature um, and the fact that he kind of believes that he is the dark one, he, even though he but, tells Lanfear that he he's the faithful to the dark, um, but he kind of believes part of his brain is just a little whacked out, and he kind of believes. But that's what I was going to say. Like, isn't he going slowly, like mad, mad territory, like crazy out of the house, crazy, like. Yeah, well, I mean, look at how well, he behaves in tear. Maybe, maybe he he's already going, going there. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what they're doing. Because I'm wondering if they're not going to eliminate Ishmael at the end of this season, is my guess. I, I, I don't think so. I just thought that if they're going, and this is based on the assumption that they're going to eliminate the tear storyline. I believe that we won't need Kalandor until much later. Uh, and essentially all Rand does with Kalandor is he goes to Tyr, he gets it, it proves to the world that he's the dragon reborn. Yeah, as, yeah. As you're if the right. battle in the I sky just, didn't. I just Google it. Yeah, you're right. In the, like, it's like Tyr. Right. So if they're not going to do... Because, because he once fights he hit, him three times, right? Or four, I don't know, three or... Yeah, more than three, once. three or four. He so does we, face him more than once. All of those yeah, so first saw, face offs are essentially Isham. All of those first face offs are essentially Ishamael. And I don't think we're going to get the one in tier because I don't think That's we're going to go to tier. So, so we have Eye of the World, and now we have possibly Falma. Right. In this season. So maybe tier next season? No, I don't think we're going to get to tier at all. I think we're going to skip over tier and go straight to Roydian, which is a, something in okay. book five. That's what I'm saying. You don't need Kalandor until much later in the book series. So why waste TV time just going to tier where Rand gets it? This, I think what they're going to do is they're going to have this battle in the sky, prove to the world that Rand is real, and then they're going to... They don't need Kalandor yet, so they're just going to put the, all of that on the table. He won't go to Tyr because all he does when he gets there is essentially, uh, after he uses it once or twice, he puts it right back in the rock and says, it's here to remind you that I still rule this place. And then he takes off for Roydian. So I'm saying, why do we need Tyr? We don't. Mm-hmm. Because all that really happens there is just some more political stuff, which is great. You know, if you're into that kind of thing, uh, but Kalandor isn't really needed until really much later. If Rand can defeat Ishmael at Falma, then there's no reason for him to go to Tyr because he has no reason to use Kalandor. Mm-hmm. So I, that's what I'm thinking is that Tyr is gone. Perrin will go straight to the two rivers as he does in book four. And Rand will head straight. This is season three. Rand will head towards Camelin, uh, because we'll now have Robin in place there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but then we still have like I heard news that we will have Elida in the first season, right? And that it will be Shore of Ab- that Gashul, this actress. Yeah, from the that people were trying to get her to be another character, but apparently yeah. they wanted her That's to, when to I come believe earlier. They wanted her to be. Yeah, yeah. they wanted um, her to go earlier, and the compromise was okay. Okay, then it's Elida, and um, I remember, and and Elida gets dropped at uh, from Camelin, and huh? she ends up in the tower. She ends up in the tower. It's a big, and that's a that's Which a big is terrible thing. for everybody yeah. involved. Yeah, it's, 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 it's terrible. And that's another thing. They've moved Loghain to Carrion right now. He's yeah. actually in the tower when all, 
when all of the stuff in the tower goes down, I believe in book four. So mm -hmm. they'll have to either get him back there or they're, they might be combining kind of. Loghain with another Forsaken by the yeah, name of Asmodian. Yeah, I think they're combining Loghain. Yeah, they're combining, they are they're combining they're certainly Loghain. not combining yeah. him with Mazum Tyne because they actually mentioned they, that person by name. They name dropped. Yeah. They name dropped, yes. So yeah. we, we know it won't be combined there. I was kind of hoping, well, I don't know how they would have done it exactly though either, but they can combine him with Asmodian because Asmodian actually helps Rand learn a little bit about the One Power. Mm -hmm. And Loghain actually gets himself restored to where he can at least sense the One Power um, by Nynaeve. That happens in book five. Mm -hmm. So My guess will be like this whole Nynaeve restoring people will, will be back already on season three. Yes, I agree. I think that's definitely happening in season three. I'm just wondering if they're going to do... I, I, uh, I think that I, I think she will end up as uh, I said I right. pretty soon. They are going to do something to unblock her this season. It has to happen this season because of Egwene, perhaps. They are going to use the Egwene drama to advance Nynaeve. Yeah, now in the book, she just makes herself mad in order to help Egwene, right? what the whole pulling on the braid and everything is so they can they can cope with it that way of her just trying to constantly make herself mad because she does that for several books she doesn't get through her block until after book six for sure because they have to be back to the tower okay so uh the other th this one was just more of a less uh just kind of an easter egg but i loved that leandrin mentioned to Varen that she'd been to Jereen. That's where she'd got those asper uh, asparagus, right? Uh, and that uh, is the location in book three, which you've read, where Egwene, Nynaeve, and Elaine actually meet Avienda. That's where the, the ship is stuck on a sandbar and they, they go to shore and kind of hang out for a little bit and then they find the uh, injured Aiel. And I think, I think it's Chiad... Or is it? Chiaz. Yeah, it's either Chiad or Bane that they end up Bane. healing. Bane. Okay, and um, I, so yeah. because Chiad <laughs> is with is Chiad with Gaul already? I can't remember, but we know we're getting Bane and Chiad, so they're going to have to meet up with Avienda somewhere further down this season because I've seen promotional footage of them all filming together. So I don't know where Perrin and Avienda are going to happen. I saw upon. three. I saw Avienda and two more. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that's Bane and Chiad that are going to be with uh, Avienda. Avienda. Mm -hmm. Perrin, I guess. So the the whole idea of Jereen, I just love that they name drop that in the episode where they introduced Avienda. Because that is the location where Avienda is introduced in the books. Uh, naturally, the stories are totally unrelated here in the television mm -hmm. show, but it was a nod to us book readers. Yes, we understand that Avienda doesn't meet up with Perrin like this. Yes, we understand that we're taking Gaul's storyline and we're putting it in there. But here, here's your little Easter egg of Jureen so that you know that we know where Avienda came from. Uh, so I loved that. Um, I think they are doing the name drops very well, except for uh, like one instance where I felt a little bit awkward, but they are doing very well in this season. Yeah. The name dropping. Yeah. So you thought the Mogadine and Grendel was awkward? No, I didn't. Thought, no. Oh, okay. I thought the whole, I thought the, like the one Elaine name dropping, like yeah. famous. I said that I was a little bit forced. But uh, being that Elaine is known for name dropping things, right? Right. Yeah, that's true. So maybe in retrospect, it wasn't that forced. It was like actually in character, but it's just like felt a little bit, ah, uh, okay. I'm not okay, sure how girl. much I want to talk about this, but as far as name drops go, did you, because I don't know how much of Gowan you've read, Gowan and Galad. Uh, obviously, you met them in book one with Elaine when Rand was there. Um, but they name dropped that it was Gowan's name day, which would be shortly after Beltine, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. So 
So they are, are they killing Gallas? I think. Well, they, they they've casted Gowan. No, but Galad, they didn't. I think and they... I they've casted Galad as well, but not. But I don't really? know if yeah. But I don't know if they're not appearing until season three, or if they're appearing mm-hmm. um, in this season. I don't think they're going to appear this season. So that's no, just my call. I, can... I think it's too late to introduce them because if anything, they would have met Gowan at the tower, right? Well, both of them probably. Yeah, they, they, they both... are both in the tower. Yeah. Yeah. With Elaine. Yeah. So, uh, but how do you feel about those two boys? You got any feelings on them yet? Having read t- three books? Honestly, no. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of unremarkable, they li- aren't they? Yeah, they didn't leave me any impression, which it, which tracks to like their uh, their reputation in the fandom. Okay. Yeah. So I've only got one more topic and then we can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Uh But my last topic is the thing that you just absolutely tried to spoil Bubba on. And that is the battle in the sky. Do you think it's going to be cheesy? Do you think it's going to be cheesy? Because I can't see how it can be anything but. And I'm cool with it. I don't care. But I just don't know how they're going to do it. They could go like Matrix way uh, and do something like trying to be cool. But I, I don't see being like, oh my God, did you see that fight? And everybody was like, oh, 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 oh. because even when, when I was reading the, the the scene, I was like, I don't know about that. How how would this happen? I had like um, difficulties imagining in my head. But I, I mean, we already established that I'm not really a visual person per se. So it might be my fault. I don't know. Well, I, I I mean, when I read it, I was just kind of like, okay, you know, just big versions of them in the sky and so that everybody mm-hmm. can see it. And uh, that's fine. I'm more, I'm more, much more looking forward to the age of heroes or, you know, to the, the mm-hmm. heroes, heroes of the last age the horn? coming back. Yeah. The horn calling them back because I want to see if they do, I want to see which ones they do. Because some of them, Mm -hmm. especially one of them, a female, uh, becomes very much important specifically to our characters later on in the book series. So, uh, Brita. Was she cast for the season? Well, see, I don't know. I I hadn't heard any. I don't think so. Okay, well, then we won't see her. Or we'll just see her in the distance. Um, I'm just saying, (laughs) well... Just waving at me. Yeah. Uh, but she has a very important role to play for the girls, actually. So um, that's that's a big deal. And they don't have to establish it right now. They can do it later in more Tello and Riyadh stuff. So um, that's not a big deal. But I do want to see which heroes they bring forth. Um, I want to see Matt blow the horn, all that stuff. But mm-hmm. first, we got to get Matt and Rand in proximation for them to be able to go together. Or maybe Rand will go by himself and Matt will go by himself. But it just seems weird to bring Matt to Karian and it not all mesh together. They just need land. All they need is land. And then there'll be a, another a troop again. And you got land and Matt and men. And Moraine and Rand, and they can all travel to Falma together. Although mm-hmm. Moraine and Land may not travel with them, because I think we've seen shots of Land being near that waygate, uh, which appears to be the same waygate that Leandrin used to come out in Falma. So, so maybe he goes with uh, Alana there. Uh, maybe he goes with Alana. Maybe he goes with Moraine. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, from these three episodes, anything at all? Yeah, we, we were just saying, like, Leandrin, we were just wondering what Leandrin and game was you know, with Nynaeve, uh, because she seemed so honest and sincere and stuff. Um, but ended up, no, it ended up being, like, very faithful to what 
happen in the books. Right. With the with the added bonus of their connection now with Nynaeve, the emotional co- connection, and Nynaeve actually calling Leandrin out. And Leandrin just did something like to wake up uh, Nynaeve so that Nynaeve had uh, like a fighting chance, no? Yeah, yes, Leandrin did. But was that to actually help Nynaeve and Egwene, or did she just think that they would get captured anyway, and she was just doing it to stick it to High Lady Suroth, because that's what I think I th- was happening there. No, I think I think uh, she, they, there was like a, an exchange of glances with Nynaeve when Nynaeve realized what was happening. That like, oh, why do you think she let Nynaeve go? I know that is not because she loves Nynaeve. I think it was just like to muddle the waters there. She was like, okay, I did what I had, I did what I came here to do. Now let's see what we can do. Yeah. And then it, it was like similar to what she did uh, to Matt. Remember what she did to Matt? Like in a moment of weakness, she was like, hey, Matt, go go console Egwene. Your friend needs you. And Matt didn't go. So it's like, okay, this this guy is going down. I gave him an out. I gave him like a slice of... Uh, like. No, uh, I don't think no. she never would have put men in there in the first place if she didn't know already that he was going to come back. It's a gamble. It was like there, there was like zero point zero one percent of chance of Matt, like really doing what she didn't think she, he would do, and she was proved right. I think Leandre is the kind of person that wants to be proved right. Yeah. But she usually does that by manipulating people like Matt, saying you can go, knowing that he won't. Yeah, but it, it, you never, you never met any person like that. Like that, they want to have always the the less, like not the last word, but they always want to like. I knew, I knew you would do that. I knew <laughs> you were like that. Yeah. I knew, so you, I you, knew you, you never, would spoil, Bubba. Yeah. I knew you would. I knew you would do that. So, exactly. Yeah. That's you. You're Leandrin. You're the Leandrin of this podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, we have determined I am Leandrin. I'm also at Bus Blockbuster on the socials. Uh, you can find Priscilla at Priscilla TV One on YouTube. Just look up Priscilla TV One on YouTube. Get a, a brand new, brand spanking new video on episode five for the Portuguese speaking audience. And you know what? I say, go ahead and turn that translator captions on. That's what I do. And uh, get some good thoughts. Thoughts other than me annoying her to the degree that I do. Uh, mostly just to get us screaming back and forth at each other because it makes for good content. Uh, until I look like uh, an ass. Matt, Matt just wants the clickbait. That's what I, he wants. I, 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 want, he wants I, want, I want the viral the clip. Bait. That's what I want. I want the viral clip. But usually those viral <laughs> clips end up with me getting more uh canceled than with uh than with me getting praised see ya yeah to Matt's audio blog at gmail.com and find all back episodes and other information at Matt's audioblog.com. Part of Double P Media, doublepmedia.com. <laughs>